Okay, so welcome back to the uh, guest lecture series with Superstition Review. Today we're welcoming Martha Solano, who is a poet, and um, she was uh, featured in the last issue of Superstition Review. Um, she's also worked as a poetry editor before, so she has experience on both sides of um, the process. So we're super excited to get to talk to you today, Martha. Oh, I'm just so happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> Of course. So first of all, would you just tell us about your career as a writer? Um, well, it all started in second grade, my career as a poet, and I had a fantastic second grade English teacher, or, I, you know, she's just my teacher. We did a, my reading improved. Um, we had a book called the Robert's English series. And I remember it was Robert Louis Stevenson, and then it was Poe, but then it was Emily Dickinson. And there was a short little poem about the fall, the seasons changing. And I had a moment in that classroom where I was like, you could, this exists? The season, you know, this is in my book. This isn't just a picture book about the seasons. And um, from there, then we did haiku. And so I wrote my first poems in her class and she doesn't know it, but she is why I'm a poet. <laughs> I was in that funny second grade. Um, in ninth grade, I had an English teacher who was also a poet. So along with reading the required books, you know, Sister Carrie and Death of a Salesman, he would bring in, he had us read like a little book of contemporary poetry and we would talk about song lyrics, you know. So, and it was so cool to have a living poet in my world for um, high school. Um, and then I didn't enroll in a workshop until I was 25. I was super, super, even though in high school, I dabbled a little and worked for the school news, uh, literary magazine and had some poems published. I was really reluctant. So age 25, Portland State, a, a poet named Primus St. John was my first teacher. Um, and then I was, I was petrified of getting critiqued and but, you know, within a year, I was sending my work out and um, starting to get poems published in tiny little places that no one's heard of. Um, and then I decided I was going to get my MFA. And I, of course, I wanted to go to Iowa. But that would have uh, been kind of a logistical nightmare. And I wasn't. So anyway, I ended up at the University of Washington working with some wonderful poets. And one of them was David Wagner. And um, at one point in class, he said, he quoted Stanley Kunitz, who said, a poet must know everything. Um, and so that's been my career <laughs> the last 30 years is trying to fulfill that, uh, you know, I'm going to know everything and put that stuff in my poems. And so I guess if you could call it a career, really what the MFA afforded was, um, I, it led to a first book and it led to teaching. So I'm able to, I don't make a lot of money off poetry, but I'm able to teach what I love, uh, teach creative writing and composition and essay writing, personal essay, and um, just sit around and read and write and work with students all day, which I, I wouldn't, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. So that's my career. <laughs> Uh, it's amazing to hear about how your like, career as a poet started so young, and now you're in the role of teacher. So, you know, grew over yeah. time. Mm -hmm. I was, I come from a family. My dad was a teacher, but he was a <laughs> physics teacher. And my aunt um, became superintendent of, of schools in, down in South Jersey. So it was inevitable. I had... Um, Luckily, my aunt, um, when when things were pushed out of the school, like they didn't need the desks anymore, they didn't, we got them all. So we set up a school in my basement and I would race home from school. This was even in first grade, race home from school to teach the lessons on the chalkboard to an empty room, which is basically my career. I teach all online. So I was <laughs> very set to teach online. Yeah. It's kind of funny. I've been doing it since I was seven. Right. You've been preparing a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you already mentioned how you uh, got your start um, 
submitting your work to literary magazines and things like that. So can you tell us more about how you find magazines and publications to submit your work to? Yeah, I mean, initially teachers would say, oh, you should, you know, there's a little magazine in Bellingham, you should send your work there. So it was first, oh, and the magazine associated with where I was going to school, um, which was Poetry Northwest. So those were my first attempts. And then now I, the, well, the three things are friends suggesting duotrope, which I pay $5 a month to be on that wonderful thing that I couldn't live without. It, it has every listing when the magazine's open, you can link to, you know, it's linked to interviews and, you know, you can go straight to the website and read sample poems or buy a past issue. So I'm, I'm always researching markets. Um, I actually, Twitter is really, really good for, you know, I'll just hop on there for five minutes and I'll go, oh, Storm Cellar's open. Oh my gosh, I, I need to, you know, buy a copy of that magazine, figure out what to send. Um, and friends, you know, so, and then I also just serially submit to all my favorite magazines. So I just have, I'm always trying to get into the Paris Review, the Kenyan Review, Poetry, Agni, you know, I'll try 15 times and sometimes every once in a while they'll, they'll take one, but it's been a long time for some of those magazines. <laughs> Yeah, so that's my process. All right, yeah. And so how have those experiences with literary magazines affected your, or played a role in your career? You know, I was thinking about this when I was preparing. I can't even imagine not sending my work out. Like I, I just finished reading an Emily Dickinson book called These Fever Days. And I thought that she, really adamantly didn't want to publish but I think if she hadn't started declining in health she would have started publishing that was really a revelation from that book like she was getting a lot of encouragement to publish um and I think she would have I think she would have busted out so I I just can understand that just desire I just want to share and I I love the lotteriness of it I mean I if I wasn't a poet and I was playing the slots, I, I would, you know, I would be in Gamblers Anonymous. I love playing the odds. The higher the odds, the better. I mean, I, I, it feels so good when an editor writes back and says, we want this. It just makes me so happy. And I, I don't know, I'm addicted. <laughs> what can I say? I'm a gambler. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's like, I feel like that's more of an interesting or dynamic relationship with it because, um, you know, we've heard from a lot of authors so far. So it's so fun to hear about everybody's different relationships with the publications that they read and talk to and publish their work in. So that's really fun. Um, and then uh, more on the side of your experience with editing, um, what are, is your advice to our editors as they read submissions? Like, what are some elements to look for in a poetry piece? Well, I know that it's really, really subjective and everybody goes you know, wild for certain things. And I don't wanna, by saying what I'm gonna say, I don't mean to say that a, a quiet, um, careful, very crafted, constructed poem is, is not a fantastic poem. And, and almost every day I come across poems like that. Um, and, and I would accept a poem like that. But generally what I'm really wowed about is just when I'm thrown out of my seat, when I see something I've never seen before and the language is just so original and so, but really usually wacky and out there and you know, I, you know, sometimes like when I read for Crab Creek Re Review, I'd be up at one in the morning just, you know, reading hundreds of submissions and all of a sudden, you know, I get this poem from someone I'd never heard of. That's another thing. You know, I, I love pulling, you know, getting people uh, who I've never heard of and just being like, we have to take this. This is so wild. You know, I woke me up. I had to read it six times. I, I try to figure out how did how did they pull it off? So that's, you know, that's what I'm generally excited about. Usually there's, you know, but that's an aesthetic, you know, I, and, and as an editor, I, I picked all kinds of poems that did other things, but that's kind of what 
my mind goes to when asked that question. It's just something I've never seen before, just something um, so powerful, but it also should change the reader, you know, and there's some risk, some surprise. Uh, and, you know, Emily Dickinson said the thing about, the, you know, pulling the top of your head off. For me, it's more like I, I'm in a new world. I'm having emotions I didn't know I was having. Like the whole world just disappears and I'm, I'm there in the poem and I'm changed by the time I, I finished the poem. And I just, I want to, I've had a whole experience in that, whether it's a minute or five minutes, you know, that I've, everything's disappeared. So that kind of just sucking the reader in is really, really important too. Yeah, that's um, a common sentiment, of course, that we get from our other speakers is that, of course, it's subjective, of course, but we do still love to hear from everybody. And so the part about, um, you know, how the poetry changes you, I feel like that's something that a lot of people can look for, even through their subjectivity. Um, so those were all of the questions that I had specifically prepared. So now we'd like to take some from the audience. Um, anybody is welcome to unmute themselves and ask or send them in the chat and I can read them aloud. I have a question for you. Um, we found this a lot in our last reading session um, that, I, I, and you know, I've been editing SR and I read every submission, so. <laughs> Um, I've been editing SR for 15 years now. Um, we take five poems per packet. And I've been noticing lately um, that some of the poets are having, are curating their packets in ways that don't do service really to their work. And so I wanted to know from you, how do you curate poems into packets? Oh, oh, that's a really good question. And that's something I've also no noticed on the other side. Whether you put your best work first or you kick them like hard at the end <laughs> with like, now try to reject me with this one. Um, hmm. Do I try to, I really, really would hope that the editor would read everything and with equal attention and caring, but I hear what you're saying. The first poem I think has to be the knockout poem. Cause you don't know if someone on the other end is just gonna go, oh. I mean, we're all busy, we're all tired. And even when you're reading poems, you know, I have to be aware that you're not always your best self hundred percent. I mean, I really, really would, if I got in that kind of mood, I would leave the, leave and come back I'd say this is not the night to be you know I, I, everything doesn't look good tonight no, that's going to change tomorrow and it usually would um but in terms of my own yeah I I try to only send what I think are my best poems I mean how many magazines say that only send your best work I think it's finally been pounded into my head like don't try to sneak in a, a weak one but Sometimes you don't know, you think you're putting your best poem first and they, they take the last one. I mean, I really, I don't know. <laughs> That's my ultimate answer. So do you have, um, do you ever do workshops with your friends on submitting? Um, you know, we mostly, I have a group, we get together on Zoom and we just swap, you know, we swap tales about magazines we've been accepted in, the editors, what to send, where to send. Um, we've had, we call them submission parties. I think when they first started, we'd actually bring the poems and sort of just chat about, well, what are you sending them? And, you know, but we don't do that anymore. There's less hand holding that way, you know. Um, I, like I said, I will research a magazine. I won't just pull it up and, you know, I'll usually take my time, read an issue, mull over it, and then go, hmm. So they really like, you know, wacky surrealist stuff. I'm going to have to think about that for a while, you know, and, and that is that whole slowing down. And even when I think I've got the man, the, the submission all put together, I'll say, don't hit send, don't hit send. Hit draft, go away, have some food, come back tomorrow. 
and I'll inevitably tinker some more, pull a poem, find a typo, you know, it's, it's good to sit on your hands. I, I realize that like, you just don't want to, just because it's unsubmittable and boom, 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 it's so fast. And I, you know, every, I send out poems and occasionally I go, I can't believe I didn't see that, you know, missing article or it happens, but you know, it's more about really pin, trying to pinpoint that magazine and, and those editors the best as you can. So maybe there's one poem that, you know, really fits their aesthetic and it is, you know. And going along with that, like, do you have, um, how do you match your submissions to a market? Is it just through research? Do you just get a gut feeling? Well, you're talking about, okay, a magazine. I, you know, I, I subscribe, like I've been subscribing to West Branch for years and I can't get in there. And I really like to, you know, sit with it. Like I said, I just, what kind of, what are they looking for? Like, why can't I get in this magazine? <laughs> um, it's crazy, but then I enjoy reading the poems just for themselves. But I'm also that, that side of that critical brain is just working to figure out what, what the aesthetic is. It's like, well, the, the editor, it's changed hands. It's, it's even, it's so wild, but there's a lot of um, ref, there's a lot of um, allusion to gods and goddesses and very esoteric stuff. And I think, well, maybe my stuff just isn't quite heady and cerebral enough. Or I need to write a poem where there's, it's not just about me, you know, these poems are real. So those, then I'd start fashioning my submission, you know, not to, not, there's a, there's some amount of risk and personal, uh, you know, personal risk, but I'm noticing more of the poems um, go outside of the poet. Like there's one by Jessica Jacobs that's just absolutely, um, you know, <laughs> She's going into the Bible in such detail, the Old Testament. I'm like, okay, that's one. And then there's Josh English had a poem in there um, that was really personal and risk-taking and surreal. So I said, okay, so you, you have to, okay. And then there's just send some poems, you know, see what happens, but it's all going on in my mind at the same time. You know, just lighten up, don't overthink it is always there. And so it's like, how calculating can you be? You know, those two, and then somewhere in the middle, you know, you know, then sometimes I'll hit send and say, well, how do I know that they didn't want these other five? You know, you could, you could drive yourself batty that way, you know, so it's just, so, you know, if a poem, if poem is out, it should be out there in the world, eventually someone will take it. It might take 20 times, but. I'm going to ask another question that I think will be interesting for our trainees as they complete the project. So the project that they have is to study several issues of our magazine, pick um, some a poem that speaks to them and, you know, talk, speak to it, you know, and then they have three submissions that they're evaluating. And when we do our work, we do what we call a vote and note. <laughs> so we do a yes, no, maybe, and also a short description of why we felt that way. And I, I have the editors all think about um, content, composition, and craft. So every poem that is accepted has to have, uh, you know, since we take 10 poets per issue, we don't want, um, you know, overlap of content. We tend to get a, a lot of overlap um, you know, with father poems or, you know, cancer poems or <laughs> <That's> <laughs> New Testament yeah. poems. <laughs> so it could be a really, really good poem. And it's just, we yeah. got too many of those. Wow. Ooh. And I can't tell you how many times we've had, just call it the New Testament poem. You know, we have two and we have to, we can only print one and how, which New Testament poem wins, right? So I'm really curious as to how you make those as an editor. So sitting on the other side, how do you make those 
very critical decisions when when it's such a fine line between what goes in the magazine and what doesn't. Oh, yeah. You know, I mostly, at Crab Creek Review, we did alphabetical order most of the time. And then we got an editor who was so good at, you know, figuring out the story of the larger story. But I have to, I have to plead ignorance on that aspect. I mean, I would just pick the very best poems. I never thought, oh, we already have a New Testament poem, but somehow it worked out. Um, and I would, I would the, really um, just be looking for the, you know, the, the most well-crafted, um, you know, well-structured everything, just wow poems. And kind of, that was when I just kind of passed them off. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not the person to ask about, um, do we already have that kind of a poem? Sorry. I actually have a question. Um, okay. I mean, we've all read poetry that we could say, we can look at it an, an objectively and say, this is a great poem, right? But our personal aesthetics and taste might dictate otherwise. So how do you like get, like how do you balance that? Like it's a great poem and form and craft. And you know, maybe it is worthy to be published, but on a personal level, you're like, I just I'm not feeling it. So how do you kind of balance like where you take your own personal taste out of the 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 picture? Yeah, I mean, I think it's also you know, you're working with a team. So if that's the case and three people love it and I'm saying, really, then, you know, we don't, we didn't work with consensus at Crab Creek Review, you know, there, I think at one point it was like once, once an issue, you got to say, I don't care what anybody thinks we got this, what you get one of those, only one of those. Um, but you know, so there would be discussion. And I just remember most of it was was um, online, but, and it was pre-Zoom. So we'd be doing this by email and, and one person would be saying, we can't take that. I think it's, you know, it's appropriation. I, you know, and I'd say, actually, I think this person is writing from their own, um, you know, self. So that would, we'd go back and forth about that. And I took the poem and luckily I was right. And it wasn't, you know, appropriation, but, um, I feel like, you know, I was so lucky. I got such free reign at, um, at the critical times at Crab Creek Review to override um, <laughs> some, you know, those like in that case, I said, no, we're taking it. Uh, but yeah, and the thing is every magazine has its aesthetic. So there's no reason to, um, you know, apologize for taking the poems that um, meet your aesthetic. I mean, and whether or not you have to uh, come to consensus. Like when I think of a magazine like Hopper Nickel, he likes wacky, wild stuff. And he's not making any excuses about it. He's not gonna take a, a really pared down, super, super earnest, you know, un, I, I wouldn't say it's uninteresting, but I mean, it would have to really do something well for Wayne Miller to take a, a, a really pared down, quiet poem. I'm trying to think. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to name names, you know what I mean? But then he could, he could always surprise us. But he's also, I think, working with students. And I'm not sure what, um, how many editors there are. But you know, I, like I said, I just don't think it's okay to have personal taste. It's okay to say, I am not seeing it. You know, it's not, it's not doing it for me. It's not making my socks roll up and down. I have a question from Bree, who's our current um, poetry editor. She sent me some questions over since she wasn't able to be here today. Um, so in terms of both your writing and editing, are there any themes or topics that you find yourself drawn to in particular? Um, yes. 
Well, I was just, I was anticipating this was going to be asked because I never know. I really never know sometimes where the inspiration is going to come from. Um, for instance, we had a friend visiting and they started playing um, Free Bird, my daughter um, and her uncle and, um, you know, Leonard Skinner. And I had to write a poem about this kid in seventh grade who brought a guitar to class and started playing Free Bird and wouldn't stop and played it a thousand times. If somebody had said to me when I woke up this morning, you're going to write a poem about Free Bird and Jersey and, you know, seventh grade, I would have said, what? what why but you know it had been sort of in the back of my mind for years so sometimes there's just you know a trigger um another thing is uh, i have been for the last few books just so interested in what's going on with the cosmos and the planets and just you know that whole thing as a hobby horse space travel i mean but lately during the pandemic it's um well, this is my partner's fault. He he wanted to know what was before the Big Bang. And <laughs> the, it turns out the big moment is the first trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. And if they could figure out um, what happened then, they feel like they'll know <laughs> everything. <laughs> so that rabbit hole has been gone down and I, I'm obsessed. I'm reading all these books. Um, and there's a new one coming out, you know, called, well, there's one called the first three minutes. I think this one is like the second before this, you know, anyway, that's, that's one of my hobby horses. Um, but you know, it just, I, I like just throwing stuff into my poems that I never would have imagined belong there. So sometimes I'll just reach and grab a book and say I need the letter R and the first word with the letter R. <laughs> yeah, I'm also an N plus seven person. So you could there's a an online generator. You can throw a draft in there and it'll change every seventh word to the next word in the dictionary. And um, I was doing that a lot the last year. Um, so fun. So I do, I do love to pull out the ordinary word and put the word that's seven down the dictionary or it, it's just so fun. It just makes me laugh. And sometimes there are surprises that the replacement word is so much better. So yeah, there's a certain amount that I want. I want that surrealist element of uh, just jarring the reader. I don't want the expected, um, you know, I just don't want, and, and I want to make sure I don't have any cliches. And beyond that, I just want to totally, well, it doesn't always, sometimes I write a narrative poem and there's none of that. Um, and one I just finished is about that woman who went to get a glass of water, came back and there was a meteorite on her pillow. And I just told that as straight narrative. Um, so it just depends, the poem, the poem really decides, you know, if I finish a draft and I say, yeah, 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 this is good, but it's not, it's, it's not done. What should I do? And that's when I put it in the, in the generator. Um, it's just not, you know, just not shaking things up. It's not, it's not making me feel like it's anything special. So then I'll just try to push it further. Yeah, those sound like really fun ways to kind of change up things, get new ideas. So I think we should use some of those. <laughs> I'm giving Anybody you all my secrets. This? I'm giving you my toolbox. I know. Yeah. We have to use the generator one, though. That sounds so fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap up and end our recording now since we're at 30. So let's see. We'll 